Well, good morning, church. Would you please stand with us this morning as we worship our God and Savior? The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. Death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried, but he lost. You cannot be stopped. When we cried for freedom, you tore down the walls. Welcome to Mount Airy Bible Church. We're excited to have you here worshiping with us this morning. Whether you're a guest or this is your home church, we invite you to fill out our connection card. Essentially, that's a way for you to connect with us and for us to connect with you. If you have questions about the church, questions about faith, if you have a, a prayer request or a praise, something you want to share with our staff or our elder board, we invite you to fill out that connection card. It's designed for this church. And you can do that one of two ways. You can either scan that QR code on the screen or you can tear out that perforated section in your bulletin, fill that out, hold onto it to after service, and you can just place it in the offering box that's between those two double doors on your way out. 
And before we continue in worship this morning, I just have two quick announcements. First, the Men's Ireland Mission Trip, which is happening in October, if you are interested in going to that, the deadline to sign up is this Wednesday, April 17th. Again, you can scan that QR code for more information and to sign up. And all these events are found at mountairy.church slash events. And also, Crossroads Freedom Center, which is a recovery and addiction ministry, is hosting a golf charity fundraiser Friday, April 26th. And if you're interested in being a part of that, playing in that tournament, just being a, a sponsor of that event, uh, you can again sign up at mountairy.church slash events. But more importantly, if you're interested in seeing the worst game of golf you've ever seen in your life, I'll be there and you can watch that too. So again, church, we are glad you're here this morning and we look forward to worshiping with you. Hey, Pastor Matt, you look pretty good. That jacket, brand new, just so you know. <laughs> anyway, good morning to you. Obviously, you know the news. We'll be praying for Israel. And please understand, to us, it's not the politics. It's human life, whether if they're, you know, uh, of the other side. It, it doesn't matter. We're praying for the salvation and peace in that land. And same way with what's, what's happening in Russia. So join me in prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we pray. Uh, Father, for an immersion family, as, as they temporarily had to say goodbye to Dad, but not permanently because we have a risen Savior. But Father, we pray for comfort for all them. And Lord, we also pray that these bombs, Lord, that they, they explode in empty places, in empty fields, and in places that's uninhabited. Lord, we pray your angelic army will block them. Father, we pray for peace for Israel as you tell us to pray for them. We pray for your covenant people to come to faith in Christ. And Father, for all people there, people of the Palestinian nation, Lord, we pray, Father God, for their salvation to come to, to both groups. Just as you brought Jew and Gentile and made a new creation in the body of Christ, Lord, we pray this for these two ethnic groups to come to faith. We pray, Father God, for what's taking place in the nation of Ukraine. And as we've been there so many times and, Lord, and touched lives, Father, we pray that the seed we planted will have effect, that you would receive the glory because it's your seed, your gospel, your life. Father, we pray for those people particularly your servants, Pastor Oleg, Pastor Peter, Pastor Sasha. And Father, we also pray for those who are afflicted. Again, we pray for Steve Allen, Lord, that you'd raise his body up and strengthen him, Lord, and Sandy as she ministers to him. And things we're not even aware of, Lord. Burdens that people are bearing right now as they enter through the arch of the door, Father, may they have their load lifted in the assurance that you're working all things according to the counsel of your will and they're good. But Father, may this be a comfort. May he feel loved by the body of Christ. That you administer to every need. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Keith. Would you please stand with us? With all the turmoil going on in the world, we praise God that we are able to worship him this morning with what scripture calls a joyful noise. together I know there's a way this is the start we're singing a brand new song lift up your heart worship the Lord our God he is the champion of heaven healer of the broken stand up rejoice make a joyful noise Jesus overcoming all the distance we made. 
Jesus overcoming all the distance we made. Fill us with your kindness and lead us to repentance. For such a time as this we pray. And people come together, I know there's a way. This is the start. We're singing a brand new song. Lift up your heart. Worship the Lord our God. He is the champion of heaven. Healer of the broken. Stand up. Rejoice. Make a joyful noise. If you know his voice, make a joyful noise. Love is a battleground. Laying my weapons down, hands up to heaven now, make a joyful noise. My heart had to hit the floor to find all I'm longing for. But I know there's so much more than a joyful noise. Love is a battleground, I'm laying my weapons down, hands up to heaven now, make a joyful noise. My heart had to hit the floor to find all I'm longing for. Cause I know you're so much more. This is the start. We're singing a brand new song. Lift up your heart. Worship the Lord our God. He is the champion of heaven. Healer of the broken. Stand up, rejoice. Make a joyful noise. Start. We're singing a brand new song. Lift up your heart. Worship the Lord our God. He is the champion of heaven. Healer of the broken. Stand up, rejoice. Make a joyful noise. If you know his voice, make a joyful noise. Yeah, if you know his voice. Make a joyful noise. Amen. Amen. Worship Him this morning. We raise a hallelujah to our God and King. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief, I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. And heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. inside of me I raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah you lost your hold on me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive Sing a little louder. 
the Lord this morning. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him.
King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hidden with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. You may be seated. One of my favorite lines in that whole song is, Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. He was the just and righteous sacrifice in our place. And yet scripture calls us then to live our lives as living sacrifices and to offer up to him our praise, our worship, our song, our lives. Uh, Betsy Marr has prepared a special for us this morning that is just that, an offering to the Lord. Please listen. to walk with you, talk with you, not miss a single thing you do, discern the where and how you want to move. We want to take the time to hear your heart, get to know the friend you are, partner in the things you want to do. We're not satisfied with empty words, not satisfied with playing church. We want a real encounter. We want a real encounter. We won't settle for a lukewarm faith. We're living for the face to face. We want a real encounter. We want a real encounter. Tear down the altars of self-righteous plans, the idols built to fear of men, the lie we have to work our way to you. Flip every table of religiousness till holiness is all that's left, just worshipers in spirit and in truth. Tear down the altars of self-righteous plans, the idols built to fear of a man, the lie we have to work our way to you. Flip every table of religiousness till holiness is all that's left, just worshipers in spirit and in truth. We're not satisfied empty words not satisfied with playing church we want a real encounter we want a real encounter we won't settle for a lukewarm faith we're living for 
I hope that's your testimony as well. Thank you, Betsy and the music team for leading us today. Hope you want a real encounter with Christ, not just going through the motions, not just checking off a box somewhere. But Christ is true in your life and you're living authentic faith. And I tell you what, I think it's getting harder. I think the uh, tactics of the enemy are becoming relentless. But do not lose hope because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And we never want to lose sight of that. Even though the battle sometimes looks like it can be going the wrong direction. I read the last chapter. I know how this all ends. And he will be king of kings and lord of lords. So I encourage you, stay focused, stay faithful, and trust him in the midst of whatever you're dealing with. The love for equals is a human thing. A friend for friend, brother for brother. It is love what is loving and lovely. And the world smiles at that. The love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, the sick, the failures, the unlovely. This is compassion. It touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing. To love those who succeed where we fail, to rejoice without envy with those who rejoice. The love of the poor for the rich, the world is always bewildered by that. And then there is the love for the one who hurts us. Love for the one who does not love us, but mocks or threatens or inflicts pain or ignores. The torturer's love for the torturer. This is God's love. And it can conquer the world. Every one of us are going to face people who hurt us. If you haven't already faced it, you might be experiencing it now. Someone that you really thought highly of or respected. It's common to do the human love. Most people do that. It's compassionate to do the second one. It's commendable to do the third one, but it's Christ-like to do the fourth one. To love those who really are unlovely. To love those who just, we really want to avoid. And if we could really draw a circle around our lives, we would keep them out of that circle. Don't you find it fascinating that God just does not let those people get away from us? And don't you find it also fascinating that we might be that very person <laughs> that God is using in someone else's life? And they're like, oh, there they show up again. We always think of it the other person, right? You know, it's that person out there. If they could just get away and leave me alone, I'd be happy. And, and they're saying the same thing maybe about us. Today we want to look deeper in this area of the love of God and God's desire for us to love others. And I don't know there's a harder journey to walk for a Christian than to reach that hand out, to hug that person, to tell them you love them when you know they've hurt you, when they have done things, they've said things behind your back. And what's even tougher is when that person is somewhat close to you. She would have called a Christian a friend. It's part of the journey. Do you think God makes mistakes? He knows what he's doing. And he's working all things out perfectly. And he's chiseling away at our own hearts. It's so much easier to say, if that person got their act together, my life would be a whole lot simpler, right? We're missing. That's not God's... What, God's up to. God's working here on our hearts. And I pray we're listening. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for the challenge of music this morning. And I just pray, Lord, we'll not lose sight of your call in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in 1 John chapter 4, moving our way through this great book that challenges us about having a relationship with God and a relationship with one another. I find it so much easier to have a relationship with God. That is so much easier. But how can you say you love me who you have not seen and you can't love each other who you do see? And so the challenge of God to us is pretty strong, isn't it? 
He's almost like God saying, don't you tell me how much you love me when you can't love this way. And yet we can justify all the reasons why it's okay not to do that, can't we? Well, look what they did. Look what they said. Look how they acted. Look whatever. And you can draw your list and you can justify anything you want to justify. But is it what God wants us to do? So last week we looked at the, the communion that comes from loving one another, the relationship, what God's called us to do. Let me just look over at Matthew chapter 5 before we get into 1 John 4 further today. A passage that you're familiar with but might be worth us opening with today. The Sermon on the Mount, if you just wanted to carve out five, three chapters and just pause there for like a lifetime, you could probably do that. What Jesus says in these three chapters in 5, 6, and 7 are just extremely powerful. Chapter 5, verse 43, and we'll be back in the Sermon on the Mount before the days are. You've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was becoming very common. And unfortunately, I think people feel like, well, I can love my neighbor, but I really don't care about my enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Did you hear what he said? That person, those people, those individuals that seem to be causing you some toughness right now, hardship or struggles in your life, here's what Jesus said. Love them. Bless those who curse you. I bless those who bless me. That's a lot easier, isn't it? Well, they bless me. I bless them back. Bless you, bless me. But, you know, that's fine. You curse me. Well, I won't say I curse them. That sounds pretty harsh. But you don't want to bless them back, do we? I don't. Do good to those who hate you. My goodness. And pray for those who use you and persecute you. You know, sometimes people say, well, they used me. Get over it. It's life. That will give you reason to pray for them. That's not really what I want to do. <laughs> for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't the tax collectors do that? And the tax collectors were looked at as some of the worst people in this world, this era. That's why when Jesus calls Matthew to follow him, a tax collector, the disciples must have been like, you've lost your mind. No one wants to hang around a tax collector. But if you only love those who fit in your circle, who dot your eyes like you and cross the T's like you, who think like you, who are like you, if that's your circle that you can't get past, he's saying your faith isn't much different than the Pharisees and the hypocrites who talk about a relationship with God and can't move past their own feelings and hurts. If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than that? Tax collectors do that. So this passage, what John's trying to draw our attention to, he's trying to say, look, if you really want to follow God, authentic faith that we just heard sung, if that's what you want, do you understand it's going to cost you? And you know what's going to cost you the most? Your pride. Because that's what, the, that's what causes the walls to come up. That's what causes the barriers to come up. And God says... I resist the proud and give grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Leave it in his hands. Let him take care of it. First John, our lesson today is not the command or the communion, but today is the confidence that comes from love. The confidence. Now, why am I using the word confidence? Well, because one day we are going to stand before God. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in the presence of someone famous before. Maybe there's been a time you've been in someone's company and, and you thought, wow, this person's pretty, wow, you know. You, you feel like, you want, can I get a photo with you? I remember I was in Myrtle Beach once and I had, we were having lunch. And there was this man sitting kind of diagonally from our table. And he just had these shoulders and you're like, this dude has played some sport. And that just happened to look down. Yeah, this sounds creepy. All right, forgive me. He had this big ring on his finger that looked like it weighed about 50 pounds. And I'm like, the dude's played something. So you know me. I'm like, 
who are you? <laughs> and come to find out he was a pro bowler. He'd been in a pro bowl football player. I looked him up later and looked all about him. Incredible gentleman. But I was like, I want my picture with this guy. I know about pro bowler football player, you know. And it was pretty cool to say I hung out with him. And we're buddies now. We're best friends. No, we're not. But anyway, I hung out with him for just a few seconds, took his picture. And I can show you, if you don't believe me, that I'm making this story up. But I thought about this in relationship to how I felt being around him. It was kind of like intimidating. I mean, his arms were like as big as my body. You know, he probably could bench me twice. You know, I'm thinking, who is this guy? And it was a little intimidating. Well, it wasn't a little. It was a lot of intimidating. And I'm like, wait a minute here. Do you know what? We're going to stand before God one day. You talk about intimidating. And First John's been telling us, look at verse chapter 4, verse 12. You have not seen God. So he kind of threw that in there. We wove that into last week's message. You haven't seen God. And so he's going to challenge us that we're going to one day stand before God in the confidence that we ought to have. You know that you can have confidence when you stand before God. But listen to what Scripture says. I'm just going to read these verses to you very quickly. Matthew 12, 36. But I say to you, every idle word men shall speak, they shall give account of it in the day of judgment. Did you know that was in the Bible? Matthew 12, 36, every idol. That would cut out half our conversations, wouldn't it, if we really took it literally. Romans 14, 10, why do you judge your brother? And, you know, it's so easy to judge them. If they did, if they did, and point the finger. Or why do you show contempt for your brother? You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, that intimidates me. More than being in the presence of this pro bowl or football player, I'm going to be standing before a holy God, and you know what? I'm not going to be able to pull the wool over his eyes. I'm not going to be able to say, but they did that. But she said this. Well, they, whatever. He's going to look at me like, really, you want to go there? 1 Corinthians 3. The fire is going to test everyone's work of what sort it is. If the work has been built on indoors, you'll receive reward. If your work is burned, he's talking to Christians now, you will suffer loss. That's why he wants us to have confidence before God, and particularly in this area of loving one another. 1 Corinthians 4 or 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Wow. He's not only going to open up our works and what we do, but even the motives, my heart attitude behind it comes before God. That's what the scripture says. 2 Corinthians 5 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I want to have confidence. You know, when I taught years ago, I never gave them pop quizzes and stuff like that. I just I always tried to get them ready. I want them to succeed. You know, the Bible is full of information so that we can succeed and stand before God with confidence that he's going to say, well done. Hebrews says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Is that intimidating? And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we've covered this in 1 John 2, we may have confidence, same word we're looking at in this text here, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So obviously there are going to be those people who are not going to have confidence and are going to be ashamed before the Lord. And it's in this area that he's addressing is loving one another. Now I thought that was fascinating that he, you don't hear this talked about much about the judgment seat of Christ, but it's right in this passage where he's going to challenge us about having confidence, not being fearful, and understanding that one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to challenge you about what have you done with your life. I, I can't even imagine what petty things are going to be that important to us on that day. The petty little things that got us all upset. We lost sleep over it, got us all ruffled up. Can you imagine standing for God and saying, yeah, can I just tell you about the time I wasn't invited to that party? And I was upset for a month. Yeah, that was really a big issue, wasn't it? Can I tell you about the time that person spoke behind my back? Yeah. What about it? Well, you know, that really offended me. Yeah. 
I, I just can't see these dialogues happening with God when we stand before him as significant. And yet we let them into our lives and they keep us up at night and they worry us and they aggravate us and they stir us up. And that, none of that's healthy. Somewhere along the way, we're going to have to be like Paul when he challenged them in 1 Corinthians 5. Sometimes we just got to let things go. Well, I just can't let it go. You don't want to let it go. It's not that you can't. You don't want to. You're getting some fuel from holding on to this thing that's tearing you up inside and learning to let it go. Walk away from it. It's not worth it. Confidence. By loving one another, he says in verse 17, by loving one another, love has been perfected among us. By loving one another, love has been perfected among us. So that's the first one. He wants to help us to think through. By love one another, love has been perfected among us. Look at verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this. Now, if you're really watching this from the uh, Greek, you'll see the phrase in this actually is first in this phrase. In this, well, what's he talking about? What's he talking about in this? Love has been perfected among us in this. Well, he's got to go be going back to verse 12 if we love one another. If we love one another, in this, is what he's saying, the love is being perfected, being matured. That's what that word means. It's being developed. You see, when you first, you know, if you ever get, you know, those that get married and, and, you, and you're married for like 50. I remember I used to go over to Lorian to visit my mom. And there was an older couple. They were like in the foyer. And I remember walking in. They were there like every time. I don't know if they really spent all their time or what, but they were there. I've seen like every time I went. And they were both pretty much asleep. They looked like ancient. And I'm ancient, so you know how old they must have looked. And he had his hand over, and she had her hand, and they were sound asleep holding each other's hands. And I looked at that, I'm going, you rascal. <laughs> you see what he was doing? His love had grown from the time they probably met. I didn't, I didn't know who they were. They were always sleeping when I got there. But that's what God's saying, your love being perfected. You know what? We can't love on the highest of levels unless it's stretched and matured. That's why in marriages you have these conflicts that come into your marriage. They're not to destroy it, they're to strengthen you. Unfortunately, sometimes it destroys them. No one has seen God at any time, but we've seen one another. In this, loving one another, your love can be perfected and developed and matured, moving from a phileo love, which is a general love, to more of an agape love, which is a stronger love. Now, let me make a disclaimer here, which I think needs to go out there. I don't, I don't believe that you need to be continuously beat up on either. I, I don't want to give you that impression. You know, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men, which means there are times you can't live peaceably with somebody. It's, that's scripture. I'm just going to tell you that. That's there. I'm just saying for general purposes here, we need to do everything we can to make sure it's not us that's not perfecting our love. And God will continue to bring that person, that thing, that event into our lives to stretch our love beyond a surface love into a deeper, deeper love. You know, some of the deepest people who walk in love have been some of the people who face some of the deepest trials. And it's amazing when you talk with them and they tell you what they've gone through and you go, oh, I got nothing. And I hear what pain they've had. And yet they talk about the joy of the Lord. They talk about their love for God. And I'm like, so what's happened is they've become a seasoned follower of Jesus Christ. God didn't send that into their life to destroy them. He sent it to, con to conform them to the image of his son. And those things that you're facing are not from the enemy to destroy you. They're not. And that person in your life, and every one of us has one. Or two. And as I've been talking about, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I know what he's talking about. Yeah. We all got that. But what are we going to do with it? Our love being perfected, growing, maturing. That's what this word means, developing from a fundamental to a stronger love. Secondly, 
By loving one another, we will have confidence in the day of judgment. This is where our word confidence comes from. Notice what he says in verse 17. That we may have boldness or confidence in the day of judgment. So your love is growing in this that we love one another, tying it back to verse 12. And your love is growing, is being perfected, so that the result of that is you can have confidence when you stand before the Lord. Remember, he summed up the law in two truths, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And love this. On these two truths hangs all the law and prophets. If you can get these two down, you're well on your way to standing for God with confidence. Loving God, love, and we sing, and that's the easier one, I believe. And I know there's hardships sometimes with us and God, but God's easy to love. He's amazing. It's us that make it hard. And yet God says, don't come to me about your love when you can't do this. I'm not interested in hearing about it. He challenges us so that we can have confidence. He's not up there trying to keep things away from us. He's actually trying to bless us. And he wants to do that. Which tells me, looking at verse 17, that we may have confidence suggests that maybe there are some people who are not going to have confidence in the day of judgment. They're not going to stand before him because they've allowed things into their lives. And you know what it does to you? It destroys you. The little things that just stay there and stay there and stay on your heart. You can recall what he said to you two years ago, five years ago, what she did to you this, and, and you hold that. And all it does is just to, continues to destroy you inside. It's like cancer. And he's trying to get that out of your life. So God isn't doing these things in your life to destroy you by no means. They're helping you become freer from the passions that are really pulling at your heart. You can have disagreements with people and not hate them. We can agree to disagree. This is where I stand, but you can walk in love. You can still be a Christ-like follower because he wants you to have this confidence that when you stand before God, and notice, I love what he says here, because as he is, so are we in the world. Now, that's a fantastic phrase, what he's trying to say here, because he's saying, look, I've done this for you already. I've modeled this for you. This is not something that you've got to rediscover. Just look at me. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what John's saying to you. And you know what came to my mind was the cross. Did you ever have a nail in your hand? You ever been whipped so much that they only hardly recognize you as a man? Your beard plucked out, thorns on your head, and then shoved on a cross? You're back against the wall. I mean, have you ever been in that situation? Probably none of us have. No, none of us have. And yet on the cross, what's one of his phrases? Father, forgive them. Really? There's people holding on to things that they say, well, they've never asked me forgiveness. Who asked him for forgiveness on this cross? got two thieves on either side of them. One of the text tells us they're both railing on him. And then one of them gets wise and says, boy, this is stupid. <laughs> and he says, today I'll offer you forgiveness. See, love and forgiveness are really tied in closely together. And it's not based on whether they deserve it or whether they've asked for it. If you just allow that stuff to harbor inside of you, it is absolutely going to destroy you. And your effectiveness for the kingdom is going to be washed down. I will not let you do that to me. And do not let me do that to you. And do not let one another do that to each other. Nor let anyone do that. Don't let them have real estate in your head. It's not where it belongs. It's hard. Because we have this self-righteousness that's built up inside of us as if, well, no one should treat us this way. Really? Let's, let's go back. As he is, as he is, what's the second say? So are we. We bear in our bodies the marks of the Lord Jesus, Paul said. If they hated me, they're going to what? Hate you. 
Did you think following Jesus Christ was going to be a picture? Yeah, but I didn't think he would betray me. She would do that to me. Yeah, you probably didn't. Jesus being God certainly knew, but he had one of his own group betray him. Peter to deny him, and they all ran away from him. After he spent three years pouring his life into them, and they went out and were gone. As he is, so are we. We're in a world that's messed up. It's got sin in it. And sometimes we're the ones causing the problem, not the ones having the problem caused to us. And this is such a powerful example when Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's a little bit later. You know the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. When Stephen is being stoned, he's been dragged out of the city. He's being rocks are thrown at him. And he's heard, what does he say? Father, don't, don't hold this to them. Don't lay this to them. Don't charge them on this. Where did Stephen get it from? He got it from our Savior. And as you're going through these struggles and these pains and these hurts and you want to say something in your mind, you know, God's really been challenging me lately. This morning, Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. You know, we want to just say something, don't we? We want to just, mm. And you ever find your temperature rising when you're in those situations? You're like, Bleh. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. <laughs> but our mind, our heart, our tongue wants to unleash. And he's saying, look, as he is, so are we. In this world. And you can have confidence in understanding, loving one another. And third one, by loving one another, we cast out all fear. And again, I think this is associated with the whole thing he's been saying. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out. This word cast is to throw out the same way Jesus used to cast out a demon. Cast out that fear. Get rid of that fear. Well, where is this fear? We have this fear in our relationships. Well, fear of what they're going to say, fear of what they may do, fear of what... Perfect love, love that God's called us to do, it casts out that fear because fear suggests torment like standing before God if you're not ready for it or torment of hell forever. But perfect love, a love that goes past that says, you know what, you've wronged me, but I'm not, I'm not going to wrong you back. I'm not going to do that. A number of years ago, my mom and dad were out to dinner one night. And I won't give you the specifics, it's not important, but just so you know, there was a, a man in there dining with another woman, not his wife. He had left his wife for this girl. Grew up in our community, we knew them caused a lot of harm. His behavior caused a lot of harm. And in our family. She got up. Walked over to that table. Hugged him. Said she was praying for him. She loved him. And went back and sat down. I can think of a thousand things I would rather do than that. But that's what casts it out. Because we would much rather not do that. It runs against every part of who we think we are inside. But that's not as he is. Because he came across to us who are sitting at the very same table who've done more things than that man had ever done. And he came across and reached his nail-scarred hands and loved on us. And we can't do that. <laughs> I'm not saying you because you're probably doing it very well. See, he says a real love for others will chase those worries away. NIV says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear by casting out demons. Because fear suggests torment. Look back at Matthew 18. Matthew 
Matthew 18. 21. Maybe a familiar story to you. Peter came and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? My brother or my sister, close member of my connection. We're not talking about physical, we're talking about spirit, we're talking about spiritual family. Sin, not just sin, sin against me. And I forgive him up to seven times, which, by the way, that's pretty amazing. Seven, isn't it? I think if you forgive somebody seven times, I'd, I'd commend you for that. I think, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Jesus said, nah. How about 70 times seven? Now, I don't believe, by the way, he wants you to have a wall chart where you do slash marks. And when you get to 491, you can beat the snot out of him. You know, I don't think that's what he's suggesting here. He's basically suggesting you never want to get to the place where you don't forgive. Therefore, the king of heaven is like a certain king and tells this story. It's an amazing story. He was settling his accounts, and when he began to sell the accounts, one was brought to him and owed him 10,000 talents. By the way, that was a lot back then. Maybe it was as bad as our debt of our government. <laughs> He was not able to pay his master command, and he sold. So that was what they did back there. If you don't pay, what you always was fascinating to me is how on earth are you going to pay it if you're sold and you're put in prison or something like that? <laughs> but that's what they did. The servant, therefore, fell before him. So he, you know, he said, Master, be patient. I'll, I'll pay you. Just be patient. And the master was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Didn't this, you know, he didn't say, okay, pay me up. He said, you know what? I'm going to do better than that. You don't know me anything. You've asked for mercy. You're done. We're finished. We're good. All, the, all good. But that servant went out who'd been forgiven so much, found one of his fellow servants who owed him pennies. That's really the extreme. Trillions to pennies. It's, it's that bad. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe me. I mean, this guy's pretty ruthless, isn't he? His fellow servant fell down his feet, said the same thing, and he would not. Notice it didn't say he could not. He would not but went and threw, himself, threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all had been done. The master, after he's called him, he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion, love, care for someone who's done something to you? Whew. What was verse 35? So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. That's what Jesus said now. He's basically saying, look, we need to practice this. That's why I'm saying, as he is, so are we in this world living out the principles. And we've never seen him, but we see one another. It's amazing what fear does. Fear cripples us and keeps us from loving Back to 1 John, one more. Perfects our love, gives us confidence, casts out fear. By loving one another, we demonstrate he's loved us. Now look closely at this verse. It's important that you see this. And I could talk about the last part of 18. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. In other words, that fear is crippling you. It's, your love's not being perfected. I should have mentioned that. But verse 19, we love him. Because he first loved us. Now, you may have a different translation there. Look closely at it. The New King James and King James both say the same thing. We love him because he first loved us. The word him probably doesn't belong in the text. The better manuscript suggests we love because he first loved us. That includes him. But it's not just we love him because he loved us. It's we love him. We love others. We love. We love. We practice love. And do you ever think about what, how God loved us? Do you ever think about what our condition was when God loved us? It wasn't like we were this choir boy, you know, or this, this uh, Sunday school girl or this perfect little child. The Bible says we were enemies. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We were without hope. We were lost. We were under his wrath. We were sinners. We were unjust. We were ungodly. We were unrighteous. We were gone astray. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air. We were in the hands of the wicked one. We were disobedient. We were children of wrath. 
we conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and mind. We were far off. We were enemies of the cross of Christ. Our end was, in, was destruction. We minded earthly things. We lived in the power of darkness. We were alienated and enemies in our minds by wicked works, dead in trespasses and sins. That was all us. On top of that, we had original sin, practice sin, law sin. We were a mess. And Jesus said, come on over here to me. That's what he did for us. Now, again, I understand there are scenarios, and I, I, I hope you understand. I'm well aware there are certain situations, as Scripture says, as much as life, then you live peacefully well. And there are sometimes you've got to put boundaries up, protect yourself. I'm totally in agreement. I'm not talking about those situations. I'm talking about the other things. As a father loved me, I have loved you. Greater love that no man destined to lay down his life for us. I mean, on and on, Scripture says he loves us. But you remember what I said about you, God? Yeah, and I still love you. <laughs> remember what I did? <sighs> yes, but, you know, I still love you. You remember my hard heart, God? Yes, but I still love you. Remember when I was not forgiving? Yes, but I still love you. Remember when I was hateful? Yes, but do you, do you see this? And then we want to grab someone by the throat for pennies. Pennies. Because in comparison to what God forgave us, friends, we can, will never, on this side, no one will ever hurt us to that level. Now, is it easy? No. But do not let the hurt of somebody destroy your walk. It's not what God wants for you. He wants you to understand this freedom, this, by loving, demonstrates that we know him. We love because he first loved us. And I can tell you right now, loving us, whether you believe it or not, was huge. Because not a person in here deserves his love. Not a one of us. No one listening on YouTube or Facebook, none of us deserve his love. He loved you. Just like he told Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 7, I didn't choose you because you were more in number or whatever else. I just loved you. And that's what he's done with us. He just loves us. Now he says, in this, walk out and do this to demonstrate it. Stephen Olford tells of a Baptist pastor during the American Revolution named Peter Miller, who lived in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Anybody ever been to Ephrata, Pennsylvania? That's a great place. You know what's up there? Green Dragon. You've not lived until you go to the Green Dragon. Is that right, Roland Carey? See? Ask them. Proof right there. Now, oh, Pastor Keith, see it? Look, I got thumbs up for Pastor Keith. Now, you know that's good. It came right out of the Greek text. And enjoy the friendships of George. He and George Washington were good friends. In Africa, who lived, also lived, Michael Whitman, an evil-minded sword who did all he could to oppose and humiliate the pastor. One day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to die. Peter Miller, Pastor Peter, traveled 70 miles on foot to Philadelphia to go to that trial. And he pleaded with George Washington for his life. No, Peter, General Washington says, I cannot give you the life of your friend. My friend, exclaimed the preacher, he's the bitterest enemy I have. What, said Washington, you've walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. I'll grant him his pardon. That's what we do when we release people from those things they're holding against us. We release them from, we're, we're freeing them from prison, and we're freeing our own heart from prison. Because the enemy wants to hold you in that as if you somehow ought to be there. I'm telling you, don't let the enemy have that advantage over you. One day we're going to stand before God. What does your love look like or lack of? What, what does it demonstrate? Does it demonstrate that you know him? Or does it demonstrate that you don't? Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, when I think about who you are and what you've done in our lives and you frankly forgave me so if I 
today, go home this afternoon, and I just start telling you, God, all the things I've ever done that's under the blood, you would say, I don't know what you're talking about. Help us, Lord, to, to love on that level. Everybody in here has probably been hurt by somebody, maybe multiple times by some people. Lord, don't, don't let it steal our hearts from you. So I pray for a moving of God in our midst. If it's my heart that has to be moved, then move it in my heart, Lord. So that one day we can have confidence when we come before you and hear, we did it well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Wally. Would you please stand with us as we close our time of worship? God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas, our God, he holds the victory, yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. As he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling souls away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Because we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet when we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We hope you have a blessed Sunday. Thank you.